You're listening to the Touch Em Up Podcast. I'm your host, Double M, and on today's episode, we have UFC 264, Poirier versus McGregor 3, preview predictions and analysis. Obviously, in the main event of the evening, you have the most hyped fight of 2021, one of the biggest fights in mixed martial arts history, the trilogy bout between top-ranked lightweight contenders, the former interim lightweight champion, Coming in off of a huge knockout victory over his opponent, Conor McGregor, at UFC 257, that is Dustin the Diamond Poirier. Going up against the former double champ, the former UFC featherweight and lightweight champion, the man who boxed Floyd Mayweather, and the man who comes in looking for redemption after getting the original victory in the trilogy at UFC 178 against Dustin Poirier, that is the notorious Connor McGregor. So without any further ado, let's get this started and step into the ring. All right, guys, how's everybody doing tonight? I hope you guys are ready for the UFC 264 preview and prediction show. We have a lot to go over. We are not going to spend a whole lot of time on the Sugar Sean O'Malley fight. Um, I mean, I think you guys know why. There's no reason why a top bantamweight did not step in with two weeks notice to fight Sugar Sean O'Malley and he comes in against a guy named Chris Moutinho which I'm not disrespecting him he's nine and four overall as a professional mixed martial artist but you know as you know it's not who we would have expected if Hany Barcelos would have gotten that decision victory in the fight against Timur Valiev I would have definitely given Barcelos the fight and maybe even if you had to pull O'Malley off the card You could do Barcelos versus O'Malley. So let's get it started. I mean, there's really no no point in wasting time. We have a lot of fights to cover and a lot of fights to discuss. We're going to start off in the prelims in the middleweight division, 185 pounds, with the number 13 ranked Omari Wolverine Akhmedov, who comes into this fight with a record of 21 victories, five defeats, and one no contest, going up against the number 15 ranked Brad Tavares, who comes into this fight with a record of 18 victories and seven defeats. Um, Overall, I think this is a very, very close matchup. I think that it is the traditional style of striker versus grappler. Who's going to be able to get their game off? And uh, when we call Akhmadov a grappler, he does strike and he does have power in his shots. He's got really good overhand punches from the left and the right, but his strikes are not clean, and 9 out of 10 times, those strikes are going to be used to close the distance, get in on your hips, get into a body lock, or get into an over-under clinch position to then work his trips, take counts up against the cage, shoot a single leg in the middle of the cage, turn the corner, get on top, and work his top game, work his top pressure, work some ground and pound, and eventually look to get a submission. If they're not, if he's not able to get the submission, he can, you know, just work from the top position and work from there. The problem with a guy like Omari Akhmedov is he has a lot of muscle mass. He's a big guy for 185 pounds. He may not be the tallest guy, but he is a big, thick, muscular guy for this division. And with thick muscles, they need more oxygen. The longer the fights go, the more grueling the fight gets, the quicker these muscular and uh, very muscled athletes tend to tire out. And that's where I think Brad Tavares can take over. You know, Brad Tavares was the first guy to go to a decision with Israel Adesanya. Um, That was actually his first tough test at 185 pounds was against Brad Tavares. After that, I believe, is when he got the fight with Derek Brunson at UFC 230. But when it really comes down to this fight, you know, Tavares, you look at him, he trains out of uh, Extreme Couture with Eric Nixick, who I just had on the podcast recently. So if you have not checked out that interview, definitely Go back a few episodes and listen to my interview with Eric Nixick. Tavares is a very, very solid guy. He's he's always going to go off of the basics. It's the jab, the pull two, the one two, the left hook, you know, the body kicks, the one left hook, body kick, one, two, three, body kick. It's all, you know, traditional style kickboxing. Um, he doesn't overextend on his punches. He does not overcommit. He plays the game safe. He's a very smart, cerebral, technical guy. And it's not going to be easy to beat him in a technical chess match. Obviously, Adesanya did, but he did last the full five rounds, even though it was a dominant victory for Adesanya. He can hang in there. He can pull counter you over your jab. 
He can. He's very good with inside and outside low kicks. I expect Tavares to try to go to that well, but he cannot go to that well too many times because if you don't set up the kicks behind the feints or kicks behind the punches, um, it's going to leave your leg out there. Omar Akhmadov can shoot in a double leg. He can pick up the leg, catch the kick, pick it up, head on the inside, transition to head on the outside, single, turn the corner, and get the takedown and be on the top position. Another thing about Brad Tavares is he has very, very solid takedown defense. Um, you do not want Akhmadov on top of you. That is a place you do not want to be if you're Brad Tavares. You want to keep it on the feet. You want to keep it at range. You want to pump your jab out. You want to use your fakes and feints and use your slick head movement. Tavares has some of the cleanest head movement I've seen in the UFC in recent memory when it comes to slipping punches and being aware of all the angles that the punches can come at. He's very good along with Brad Riddell. That is somebody that uh, he gave me, you know, flashbacks to Brad Riddell in the fight against Drew Dober recently at UFC 263. Um, when it comes down to the, the prediction, I think that Tavares is going to get this one. I think it's a tough fight for the first round, round and a half. And then, like I said, I think the muscle of Akhmadov, I think winging punches and missing and getting countered, um, getting his takedown stuffed up against the cage, whether it's Tavares pushing on the head, whether it's him, you know, controlling from the over under, getting the double under hooks and turning off the fence and then turning back the other way to then create a door to get back to the center of the cage. Um, I expect a lot of takedown defense from Tavares. I expect a lot of two or three punch combos, a one, two, a fake into a one, two, a fake into a cross hook, you know, a fake into a double jab right hand, fake jab inside and outside low kicks. I think he's going to chop up the legs. Look to chop up the body, setting up the kicks behind the feints, and cruise to a decision. So my pick is Brad Tavares to get the victory over Omari Akhmadov via a unanimous decision, 29-28. Up next is a fight in the middleweight division. You've got a battle between Trevin Giles and Dreykus Stillnox Duplessis. Um, both of these guys coming in with phenomenal records. Giles is coming in 14 victories and 2 defeats. Uh, Duplessis, 15 victories and two defeats. This is only Dreykus Duplessis' second fight in the UFC. Giles has been around a little bit longer. He's coming off um, a few wins. I think he's off two back-to-back -back fights. So Giles is coming off of a decision victory over Roman Dolidze, which was a close fight, but he was able to get the victory there. And then coming off a third-round knockout over Bevan Lewis, and then a questionable decision victory over James Krause. A lot of people believe that James Krause won that fight, but the decision was given to Giles. Um, when it comes to Dreykus Duplessis, he is a former, I believe, EFC uh, middleweight champion. Let's see. We'll check that out. We can pull it up. I believe it is EFC. Yeah, EFC Africa um, middleweight champion. You look at his record overall, like we said, 15 victories and two defeats. He also fought in KSW. Um, he was slated to face the champion Roberto Soldich for the title. Um, and then Duplessis ended up dethroning Soldich via TKO. He caught him with a left hook, circling away, pivot, check left hook, dropped him, jumped on him, and got the TKO. And then they would rematch later on, and Duplessis was defeated, but he then, like we said, returned to EFC and is a former champion there as well. So he's champions and he's a champion in multiple organizations. In his UFC debut, he faced off against a veteran and Marcus Perez. And uh, the fight started out a little bit rocky. You know, I think that Duplessis did have a little bit of the octagon jitters. You know, he was landing inside low kicks against Perez, you know, constantly like, chopping the inside, chopping the outside, stepping over to his left to land that check left hook, land the right hand down the middle. He would dart in with the right hand, jab, right hand. So 2-1-2, two, 2-1-2, two, 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 left hook. Um, he darts in with combinations and he's a very powerful striker. But uh, against a guy like Giles, who is primarily a boxer, he fights with his hands down, fights, you know, kind of pawing at the lead hand with his rear hand, leaning forward to give you that illusion that he's closer than he is, and then he steps back, counters with a left hook, counters with a jab as you step in, you know, fake, boom, pop the jab, that's what he did against Bevon Lewis, and he dropped him and hurt him in that fight, and then obviously got the knockout later on as he was up against the cage, boom, 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 jumped in, boom, I believe it was with a left hook, 
he uh, cut a corner off to his left. Boom, dropped him, landed that left hook, and got the TKO victory. Giles has power. He has power in that lead hand. A lot of the power of Trevin Giles comes from that lead side. It's going to come off the jab that has no telegraph. It's going to come off of the left hook. That is where a lot of his success is going to come. And it's also off of leaning forward, you know, using a lot of fakes with the rear hand, fake the rear hand, pop the jab, fake it, boom, straight right down the middle, you know, constantly using a lot of fakes and feints. He likes to slip, roll your shot, step into southpaw, slip, slip, come back. You know, he's always constantly, he's got very good eyes. But that boxing heavy stance against a guy like Dreykus Duplessis is going to be a problem. The inside low kicks, the outside low kicks, chopping at the lead leg is going to be a big weapon for Duplessis. And I think that's what we're going to see. I think he's going to start off using a lot of fakes. He might fake the right hand, come in with a left outside low kick, fake the right hand, step in with an inside low kick, boom, 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 chopping the low, chopping the low kicks. They're both in the orthodox stance, so it is going to be... Obviously, the outside low kicks are going to work. The jab's going to work. The one-two. They both have a one-two from the same side, and they both have the low kicks. Um, Giles is going to be susceptible because he is more of a boxing-heavy style. Obviously, Duplessis does have good boxing as well. Um, the more, the lengthier combinations come from a guy like Duplessis, like we said, he'll dart in right hand, left hook, right hand. One, two, three. Three, one, one, two. You know, one, two, check hook, pop, 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 low kick, boom, 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 low kick, front kicks to the body. I think that is going to be a big weapon for Duplessis. If it does go to the ground, I know Giles has, you know, shown good defense. He has shown an ability to get takedowns in a fight. Um, Duplessis doesn't have the best takedown defense, but I do not think that Giles is going to want to be on the ground with a guy who has so many submission victories. Duplessis has gotten guillotine chokes he's very good from a guillotine pulling guard and from a guillotine from the mount in the top position he's also gotten um, rear naked chokes in his career he can hurt you with the punches and then when you're hurt he can jump on you take your neck and get a submission we have seen giles submitted in the past he was submitted by gerald mearshart and i believe he was also submitted by another person in his career let's see pull it up it should come up on google if we go back he does have knockout victories does giles um you know so he does have power but i don't think he has as much power as duplessis oh let's see he got submitted by gerald mearshart in the third round i believe that was a fight that mearshart was losing but he came back and got the submission victory. And he also got submitted by Zach Cummings in the third round. So the longer the fight plays out, it does seem that Giles gets a little bit tired. And if he's ahead on the scorecard, sometimes he can fall into, well, I'm just going to cruise here and then get caught in a submission. That is something he's going to have to watch out for with Duplessis. Like I said, he's always looking to grab that neck. If you shoot a bad takedown, he's going to look to grab that guillotine. You know, shoot in that arm, boom, hike up the, you know, probably go palm to palm, arch his back and look to get the guillotine, roll you to your back and lock it up from the mount as well. There are various ways that Duplessis can get the finish. Um, Giles can knock out people you obviously you've seen it in his record he's got good boxing he's got good movement good ability to step back in the opposite stance and see the punches coming like we said he has good eyes however i think the inside and outside low kicks i think that i think the inside and outside low kicks of duplessis is going to be a problem for giles because of how heavy he is on that lead leg being a boxing heavy fighter he's going to want to lean on that lead leg you know draw you in with that fainting of the rear hand and he's and duplessis just going to have to come through and land those low kicks he's going to want to set it up behind some fakes and feints and uh, maybe set it up behind a right hand outside low kick right hand inside kick you know left hook to a, to an outside low kick right hand to a sweeping inside kick you know he can set up those kicks and they're very very powerful and against giles i think that is going to work early in the fight i think the first round's very close i think giles is going to land some good combinations because duplessis does fight primarily with his hands down he keeps him up in a defensive shell almost when there's punches getting thrown at him but if he's coming forward and landing his punches his hands do drop he does stick his chin up so if giles can time him stepping in he can land a power shot and hurt him but that's not necessarily how i think this is going to go um i do believe that 
Duplessis is going to get the victory here. I think he wins via a late submission. I'm going to go with a third round guillotine choke for Dreykus Duplessis. I think that the low kicks are going to work early and often. I think that it's going to kind of leave Giles stationary, meaning he can't use his head movement and his movement as effectively because when you move your head and your legs are battered, it's going to be harder for you to take that step back. It's going to be harder for you to pivot. It's going to be harder for you to get off on an angle. So I do believe that Dreykus Duplessis is going to get the victory here, go 2-0 and in his career, two finishes back-to-back, -back, and get the third round guillotine choke submission over Trevin Giles. Up next is a very, very interesting fight in the featherweight division. You've got the wizard, Ryan Hall, coming into this fight with a record of eight victories and one defeat, going up against undefeated prospect in mixed martial arts and a huge, huge prospect for this 145-pound division. That is Ilya Toporia. Like I said, nine victories and no defeats. Um, this is a very, very interesting one. Very interesting, primarily because it seems like nobody wants to fight Ryan Hall. Nobody seems to want to step in there with a guy who, if he gets a hold of your leg, if he goes for that Iminari roll and locks up a heel hook or a knee bar, um, he's going to rip your shit apart. Like, he's going to rip you apart. He's going to rip that knee apart, and it only takes a few seconds. For him to get that submission over um, BJ Penn, he was moving around, moving around, moving around, outside low kick, step in, roll into that Iminari, lock up the inside heel hook, and turn it and right when he turned it you heard bj penn scream and tap with leg locks you know you've heard a lot of people say this over and over it's very hard to know when you're in danger because one second you're okay and the next second your knee is completely ripped apart and you can't fight for almost a year so it's very very difficult to judge the danger until you're in danger and once you're in danger it's too late and with ryan hall he is very good from the outside when it comes to kicking range. He doesn't primarily throw punches. If this does get into a boxing style of fight, I do expect the Poria to light him up. I think he'll light him up with the punches. I think he'll light him up with that left hook into the right hand. That left hook to the body is going to be a big, big weapon for him against the guy in the wizard, Ryan Hall. Um, you know, we have seen in the Yusuf Salal fight that Taporia has good grappling. You saw him get the over-under position, go to the body lock from the over-under, and land a lateral drop style of throw against Yusuf Salal and control from the top and immediately pass over into mount while also controlling the one arm. So you can't really build a base until you get your arm out, but while he, once you get your arm out, he's already got your legs grapevine. He's on top of you, and he's really, really good from the top position. And when he gets you on the ground, he is going to go for submissions. That is not a place you want to be against Ryan Hall because any sense of danger with that rolling for the heel hooks and rolling with the Iminari and working from the X guard and working from the, you know, the Ashigarami game is what it's called, you know, sweeping um, in looking for heel hooks, looking for knee bars, looking for inverted heel hooks, working from that rolling on your shoulder to the Iminari roll, rolling in and, and locking up a leg and tying the opponent up. You play that game with Ryan Hall, you're going to lose 10 out of 10 times. And it doesn't matter who you are. So if I'm Taporia, I would play the game off of defensive wrestling and defensive jujitsu. But you're also going to want to play the game from a far enough away distance. You want to play from a far enough away distance so that you can't be close enough for Hall to roll for those leg locks. And if you get somewhat close and you see Hall going to, to roll... You're going you're gonna to want to angle off, you're going to want to step back, and you're going to want to circle around the cage. And once he stands back up, you you get in his face. You get in his face, and Taporia needs to use those fakes and feints. Get Hall to bite on it, and then hook cross. Get him to bite on it. 3-2. The hook is going to direct him into the right hand. He used that a lot against Yusuf Salal, primarily up against the cage, but it worked a very well for him. Um, I think a lot of fakes and feints, the jab, the fake into the 2-3, lead hook to the body, the fake into the cross, into the digging left hook to the body. Taporia has some of the nastiest body work in mixed martial arts, and you saw it against Damon Jackson. Got him up against the cage, left hook to the body, fake the hook up top, boom! right hand over the top and drop Damon Jackson. And it all came off of that body work. It all came off of the fakes, the feints, slipping and countering on the inside, countering with the hook to the body, 
boom, three to the liver, boom, three to the liver. That's going to work all day for Ilya Taporia against Ryan Hall. It's all day. It's all day with that. And I do think that Hall does have a chance in this fight. He's got good spinning kicks, wheel kicks, hook kicks, you know, anything to keep you at a far enough away distance so that he can set you up off of a kick to roll for that leg lock in the Iminari. It's going to be a dangerous game. I think Taporia is going to push forward. I think he's going to stay in boxing range or just right outside of the boxing range so that Hall can't use his kicks from the from the correct range. It's going to leave him open because he's not a technical striker. He's not the best striker. It's going to leave him open. And anytime Taporia has a chance, he's going to dig that hook to the body. He's going to go one, two, left hook to the body, cross, hook to the body. And he's going to work it over and over and over again. Until it just is too much for him, it's going to open up a shot up top, and Taporia is going to land on the chin, drop Ryan Hall, and get the knockout. I am going with the prospect, Ilya Taporia, to get the knockout victory over Ryan Hall. I think he pulls it off in the second round after working the body in the first round. So my pick is Ilya Taporia to get the victory via a second round knockout. Up next in the welterweight division, you've got a fight of the night battle, a a fireworks style of fight between Nico the Hybrid Price and Michel Demolidor Pereira. They're, the records in this fight, Price comes in with 14 victories, 4 defeats, and 2 no contests. Going up against Pereira, who comes into this fight with a record of 25 victories, 11 defeats, and 2 no. When it comes to breaking down the fight between Michelle Pereira and Nico the Hybrid Price. Um, I think you guys know this fight's going to be crazy no matter what. And if Pereira fought the same way he did against a guy in Tristan Connolly, against Zalim Madaev, I think that he would be more susceptible to getting knocked out by Nico Price. Price is a guy who comes forward, he comes to fight, he's pushing forward, front kicks. Left and right hands, you know, overhand punches, slipping and countering with the jab, slipping and countering with the right hand, countering with the left hook, you know, front kicks, high kicks, knees to the body, ones and twos. He's just a, a, a chaos. This this entire fight is chaos from start to finish, no matter who gets the job done. And the thing about Nico Price is he can be losing a fight, come back, and get a knockout victory. We've seen it in his career before. He's gotten knockouts from the bottom with an up kick for a gun against James Vick. He's gotten knockouts from the bottom with hammer fists from a stat guard against Randy Brown up against the cage. You know, he can lose a fight or be losing a fight and then come back like he did against Tim Means, you know, catching him with a shot, dropping him and knocking him out in a fight that he was losing. Price had a back and forth war with um, Vicente Luque in a fight where he was outgunned, he was outmatched, but he found a way to hurt him. He landed a front kick to the face that hurt Luque, jumped on him, took him down, almost locked up a darse choke like he got submitted with against Luque. So Price has been finished. He has been knocked out, but he comes to get the job done. It's either he finishes you or you finish him. And that's exactly how this fight's going to go. When you look at Michelle Pereira, he, like I said before, he was a little bit more crazy, you know, jumping off the cage for showtime kicks, jumping off the cage for Superman punches, you know, flying knees to a to a right hand down the middle, a jumping flying knee to a right hand like he did against Danny Roberts, you know, but against, but more recently in his career, you look at his last fight against Chaos Williams, and you look at the fight against Zalim Imadaev, he, you know, he has become a little bit more patient he has become a little bit more technical and a little bit more cerebral in his career as he's gone longer you know he's become a little bit more mature in terms of his fighting ability he doesn't push it as much as he used to and that's going to play to his benefit against a guy like Price because if you push forward and you're sloppy and you're crazy you know Nico Price is a master at that game and he can hurt you he can find a way to stun you. He can find a way to hurt you. He hurt Jeff Neal in their fight before he got finished. He always is going to hurt his opponents at some point. He's going to land. He's going to hurt you. But with Pereira, who's constantly switching his stances, constantly, you know, front kicks up the middle, ones and twos, you know, switching stances, faking and fainting, you know, jumping with the flying knees, but then angling off one, two, two, three, you know, constantly landing good punches and good combinations. 
but moving and angling and cutting angles and making it harder for the opponent to track them, that is going to leave Nico Price open for some shots coming forward. It's going to leave him open for counter shots, and I think that's a bad, bad thing going up against Michelle Pereira. Because he's so technical, he is very sharp, and since he's become more measured, his punches are going to be a little bit more a little bit less telegraphed. His game is going to be a little bit less telegraphed. And it's going to be the counter opportunities are going to be ample against a guy who just pushes forward and comes at you full speed balls to the wall in Nico Price. And I think that that forward pressure and that constant, you know, in your face style is going to be to the detriment of Nico Price. I think there's going to come a point where Price does hurt Pereira and it's going to really come down to can Pereira come back from it. Can he come back from being hurt? We've never seen him have to come back from being hurt. Um, and I think that, a, you know, Nico Price is going to test that chin. But I think at some point, you know, he's going to walk into a shot from Pereira. It's going to hurt him. And Pereira's going to jump on him and get the finish. So I'm going to go with Michelle Pereira to defeat Nico Price via a second round TKO. I think the first round's crazy. I think... That's where Nico Price does hurt Pereira at some point, whether it's with an up kick, whether it's with a, a one, two down the middle, whether it's with a high kick, um, a hook, you know, just a, a knees from the clinch. I think he does hurt him at some point, but Pereira weathers the storm with his footwork, with his head movement and with his range management. And then eventually gets Nico to walk into something, walk into that straight right hand, walk into a straight left. He gets hurt. He gets dropped and he gets finished. So my pick is Michelle Pereira to get the victory via a second round TKO. All right, to round out the prelims, we've got a battle in the welterweight division between a guy who has seen a career resurgence. And you could say that for both of these men in uh, Max Payne Griffin. He comes into this fight with a record of 17 victories and eight defeats going up against the former interim welterweight champion, the veteran of mixed martial arts. Veteran of the UFC, veteran of the WEC, the natural-born killer, Carlos Condit, who comes into this fight off of two back-to-back -back victories, which is huge for Condit, and uh, his overall record is 32 victories and 13 defeats. So obviously, Carlos Condit is going to be the veteran in this matchup. He's had way more experience. You know, 45 fights compared to 25 for Max Griffin. That is 20 more professional mixed martial arts bouts for Condit than his opponent in Max Griffin. Griffin is coming off of back-to-back -back victories as well. You know, he's coming off of that last fight against, I believe, here, let's see. He's coming off of that last victory in a knockout over Kanan Song, or Song Kanan in the first round. He landed a 1-2, which hurt him, and then he came in with a 3-2 up against the cage, dropped him, and uh, basically knocked him out from there with that 3-2. And then, you know, he jumped on him for one more shot, but it wasn't really needed. Prior to that, I believe he had a, de a decision victory over Ramiz. Yeah, Ramiz Brahimai. Uh, or no, it was, a, it was a knockout, a third round knockout. He landed some vicious elbows in the clinch and almost ripped off Brahimai's ear, ear with that elbow. Um, before that, he had a decision loss to Alex Oliveira. And then... Alright, so as we were saying with Max Griffin and Carlos Condit, um, Griffin has, you know, some knockout victories. Obviously coming off of a KO over Song Kanan, or Kanan Song in his last fight. And then prior to that, a third round TKO slash KO um, over Ramiz Brahimai, where he landed vicious elbows in the clinch, and he elbowed him to the point where he almost ripped his entire ear off. He hit the elbow, it split the ear wide open, and it was dangling off of his head. So if he lands the elbows in the clinch against a guy like Condit, the overall damage he's taken in his career, I do believe that he can hurt him. And uh, the thing about Max Griffin that I think a lot of people have said in his career that he's kind of fixed is the fact that he wasn't really a volume guy. You know, early in his career, just up until recently, he would only land a couple punches, maybe two punch combinations and move around, two punch combinations, shoot a takedown and move around, one, two, move around. And uh, he just used a lot of feints and fakes and he didn't really go after it. 
But in his last few fights, he has changed that. You know, right out of the gate, he came in with a 1-2, a 3-2, moving around, cutting angles, you know, pivots, constantly moving left and right, using fakes and feints. 1-2, 2-3, 1-2-3. And, you know, he was coming at the opponents. He would want to shoot a takedown, push him up against the cage, work from there. He has upped his activity level later on in his career. And uh, I think that can be a big weapon for him against a guy like Condit. Now, when we talk about Carlos Condit, you know, he was on a he was on a stint in his career and a losing skid where he I think he lost five, maybe six fights in a row. And just recently, he's come back with two back-to-back -back victories. Um, a decision victory over Court McGee and a decision victory over Matt Brown recently. And, you know, before Matt Brown's last fight, that that win might have not looked so good. But Brown just came back and landed a beautiful right hand against Diego Lima and, and knocked him out. So that win looks better for Carlos Condit. But when you look at his overall career... So he had the victory over Matt Brown via decision. And then prior to that, he had a victory over Court McGee. He was gone for two years from 2019 and 2020. I mean, basically he was, yeah, he was pretty much gone two full years. Before that, he had a submission loss to Michael Chiesa, a submission loss to Alex Oliveira, a, submit, a decision loss to Neil Magny, Submission loss to Carlos or to uh, Damian Maya, a decision loss to Robbie Lawler. So he was coming off of one, two, three, four, five losses. He was on a five fight losing skid before he now he's back with two victories in a row, looking for a third fight, a third win, which would put him on a three fight win streak. So you cannot count out Carlos Condit. You know, they don't call him the natural born killer for nothing. Um, I do believe that a lot of people are going to be sleeping on him in this fight against Max Payne Griffin. Just because Griffin's the younger guy, Griffin's, you know, hasn't had as many miles on him in his career. He's coming off of two back-to-back -back finishes, which sometimes can get the fans and the analysts clouded in terms of their perception of how they think the fight's going to go. Um, I do think that Griffin can win this fight if he resorts to a lot of his wrestling. But the thing is, you look at his last fight against Matt Brown, you know, Carlos Condit has improved his wrestling so much recently than it than it was before. You know, his wrestling is so improved. You know, you saw him hit a switch against Matt Brown. You've seen him go for sweeps off the bottom to wind up in a top position. You see him use takedown defense, you know, sprawling out, getting his hips out, using that switch position, winding up on top. And he's more comfortable in working off of his back. So if he is on the bottom and an opponent is in the top position in his guard, he will throw up arm bars. He will throw up triangle chokes. He will work off of his back and he will not sit there and wait for the opponent to move, which is a thing that we have seen Carlos kind of do. And that is usually what would lead him to be open for submissions against guys who shouldn't have been able to submit him, such as Alex Oliveira. But, you know, he has become more active off of his back. He does not give up those positions as easily. So it's not going to be as easy for Max Griffin to get those positions against a veteran like Condit in this fight. Um, Condit's very good on the feet. You know, since his wrestling defense has become so much better, it's allowed for him to open up a little bit more on the feet. And it's allowed for him to not be as worried when he goes in and maybe overextends on a shot and the opponent shoots in on his hips. I do expect Max Griffin to want to push him up against the cage in an over-under, in a double-under clinch position. You know, look for knees in the clinch. Look for elbows in the clinch over, you know, in the over-under, up against the cage, in the tie plum. Look for elbows. Look for knees to the body. I do expect that to be something that Max Griffin looks to exploit. I do think Griffin's going to come out and look to make a statement early, but I do think that it's not going to be as easy to put away Condit. It's not going to be as easy to put away Carlos Condit in this fight. And I think we're going to be in for a surprise. I think the kicking game of Condit, the combinations ending with the high kicks, you know, a 2-3 lead left high kick, a 1-2 hook into the overhead high kick, you know, 1-2 into the right high kick, 1-2 roll underneath into the left high kick like he did against George St. Pierre. I think on the feet, it's going to be a little bit hard for Griffin to get into a rhythm. I think Condit's going to use a lot of movement, a lot of stance switches, you know, switch stance from uh, orthodox switch left hand into a right hook like he did against Court McGee where he dropped him or vice versa. If you're in southpaw, switch into orthodox with the straight right and then boom, land that left hook off the break on the, on the exit. I'm going to go with the natural born killer 
to get a, to get the win here via decision. I think that early on it's going to be a little bit tough for him, but I think the the longer the fight goes, it's going to be harder for Max Griffin to get the takedowns. It's going to be harder for Griffin to control in that top position. I think Condi can work off of his back, land some elbows, land some punches, get up to the feet, and just land those combinations, land the combination striking. I think it's going to be somewhat similar to the fight with Nick Diaz, where he wins just off of volume, off of working when the opponent stands back and kind of stares in the mirror a little bit. And that's what I think is going to happen. I think Condit's going to land the, the higher volume. I think it's going to be harder for Griffin to track down Condit. I think it's also going to be harder for him to get the takedowns, which is going to allow Condit to, you know, stuff some takedowns, get up on the cards, and get the decision victory. So my pick is the natural-born killer, Carlos Condit, to get the victory via a split decision, 29-28 over Max Griffin. And now we move to the main card in the first fight up in the bantamweight division. You've got highly touted prospect. I wouldn't even call him a prospect at this point. You know, the UFC's cash cow of the 135 pound division, Sugar Sean O'Malley, coming into this fight 13 and 1 overall as a professional mixed martial artist, going up against the UFC newcomer, Chris Mutinho who comes into this fight with a record of nine victories and four defeats. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this fight because there's really no reason to uh, sit here and dissect a fight that is going to go exactly how we think it's going to go. O'Malley's going to come in here. He's going to tune him up on the feet, and it's going to be a first-round knockout. I mean, I don't really expect anything different, and there's that's no disrespect to, to Moutinho. I mean, I've seen some of the stuff on the regional scene. I've seen some of his fights. He's got good wrestling defense, good ability to, um, you know, do a reshoot. So stuff the takedown and then shoot back in on the opponent to get a, get them down and get in the top position. He's got good straight punches, but, you know, if he leaves his punches out there for a little bit too long, he gets, you know, tuned up. He has been hurt in previous fights. And going up against a guy like Sugar Sean O'Malley, I expect him to just play exactly how we think the Sugar Show is going to go. You know, constantly in and out, one twos down the center, fake the uppercut to the right hand, switch stance, throw a high kick, you know, throw spinning hook kicks, use that to switch stance, then throw straight left or straight right, depending on what stance it's in. Um, and just kind of style here on Chris Moutinho, you know, O'Malley, his last victory coming off after that uh, walk off KO. Um, he had Almeida hurt you know, prior to that, but, you know, a win over Thomas Almeida, who is really at the tail end of his career and really couldn't buy a win. Um, I did pick Almeida in that fight, so that was kind of a dumb decision, right? But um, sometimes you gotta, sometimes you gotta play the, the devil's advocate and pick the, uh, the underdog. And I know I pick a lot of underdogs on this show, but, you know, I just figured... Almeida's low kicks were going to give Sugar some problems because he had a lot of trouble with the low kicks of Oma of uh, Marlon Chito Vera. We saw what Cheeto just did against Davy Grant, so that was a good win for him. But um, yeah, I expect a vintage Sugar Sean O'Malley performance. Um, I expect it to go very similarly to the uh, Jose Alberto Quinones fight. You know, just push back, um, get him to guard up high. Drop him with a high kick, jump on him and get a TKO. So I'm going to go with a first round knockout for Sugar Sean O'Malley. Up next in the UFC's bantamweight division, but the women's bantamweight division, you've got the number four ranked Irene Eldana coming into this fight with a record of 12 victories and six defeats. Going up against the number five ranked Yana Kunitskaya, who comes into this fight with a record of 14 victories, five defeats, and one no contest. Um, this is an interesting one. Definitely not the one I'm the most, I'm looking forward to the most on this card, but it is a very interesting fight. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Aldana, and um, Kunitskaya is somebody, I'm going to be honest, throughout her entire career, she never really truly impressed me. And that doesn't mean that she's not a great fighter. She is, and she knows how to win, and she knows how to make it a gritty fight, make it dirty, get in your face tie you up in the over under clinch up against the cage land elbows land knees land punches she's very active from the clinch up against the cage whether it's the the tie plum the over under or the double under clinch look for her to attack with knees even if her opponent tries to tie her up 
if she's got the double unders and they try to go with the two overhooks, um, expect her to still try to land knees, try to land elbows, try to land some punches, try to land elbows over the top to cut Aldana. And uh, expect her to resort more to her grappling in this fight. I don't expect her to want to stay on the feet unless it's in close up against the cage. Um, Kunitskaya is going to want to be either all the way out or all the way in against a, a striker like Aldana. Now, Irene Aldana came into that last fight against Holly Holm with a lot of upside, a lot of hype. A lot of people were picking her to defeat the Preacher's Daughter. They expected her to come in and kind of make a statement, you know, to, to put the old title challenger, the former champion, out and then move on from there. And what we got was just a vintage Holly Holm performance. Um, I believe it was five rounds to zero, 50-45, somewhere around there. And uh, she just kind of cruised to a decision. She was beating her to the punch. Um, two, three, four punches to every Aldana one or two punch combination. I mean, it was Aldana primarily has, there, there's some things that Aldana does really good. And, uh, you know, she's very good at pivoting off that lead foot and getting out of the range. Um, the problem against Holly Holm was she only tended to go in um, one singular direction to avoid that high kick and avoid the straight shot. Of Holly Holm and uh, that just left her constantly moving in the one direction and kind of getting cut off and just beat to the punch on everything like she would go to land a combination and then Holly Holm would straight lead uppercut straight straight lead uppercut straight low kick you know one two hook low kick bah, 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 low kick um, Holly Holm has this thing that she does which can sometimes lead the judges to believe that she won and you know it's her battle cry Whenever she comes forward, every time she throws a combination, is ah, boom, ah, boom, ah, boom. And that's just kind of how Holly Holm fights. She likes to uh, be very loud and let out a battle cry when she lands her shots. But she did dominate Aldana. She was able to get a takedown um, in the body lock position. She dragged her one direction and then dragged her back the other way and got a trip takedown. Worked from the top, got into the full mount, landed some, combina uh, some heavy ground and pound from the top. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call it heavy. I don't want to contradict myself here, but landed some combinations and punches from the full mount. Um, passed guard, like, easily. It was like butter. So this is going to be a, a, the striker versus the grappler. Can Kunitskaya get all the way in, get in close, get into the clinch, and, uh, you know, work from the over-unders, work from the double-unders, work from the tie plum, land vicious knees, elbows, um, knees to the thighs, uppercuts, elbows over the top, punches, just constantly rough up Aldana. If she can make it a dirty, messy fight, she can get the, the victory here against a girl like Aldana because she has been taken down. She is not that good off of her back. She has been mounted pretty easily by a girl in Holly Holm who, yes, her wrestling has improved. Yes, she has gotten way better in the takedowns in the top position. We saw that really for the first time against Megan Anderson at UFC 225, but... She's not known as a wrestler. Kunitskaya is known to be a heavy grappler. Um, drag you to the floor, trip you, take you down, get in the top position, work from the side control, work from the full mount, land vicious, vicious ground and pound. So if it goes to the ground, I expect Kunitskaya to dominate Aldana. If it stays on the feet, I think there is the possibility that Kunitskaya lands a few punches, gets in close, gets in the clinch up against the cage, and kind of holds her up against the cage in that over-under or the double-under position. And lands knees to the body, knees to the thigh, elbows over the top. You know, one, you know, just elbows and, and little shoulder strikes. And, you know, just kind of roughing her up and just keeping the activity up to win rounds the longer the fight goes. But I'm going to go with Aldana here. I just think that her striking is going to make it really hard for Kunitskaya to get in to the clinch range and get into the range that she needs to be at. And she's going to be stuck in that mid range, which is the kick range. Which is like right outside a kick range, right outside a boxing range, or in that mid range. She's gonna get stuck there, not be able to get in close and impose her game. Um, Eldana's gonna land a lot of those hooks to the low kick. She's got a very good hook to uh, slip off the center line to an outside low kick, and you kind of shuffle your step over to your left side. So hook, um, get that outside angle, move that move laterally, and throw that kick to get your head off the center line. Really good counter left hooks. Um, as she's backing up, you saw it against Caitlin Vieira, where she caught Caitlin on a uh, side stance, landed that left hook, and dropped her. I think it's going to be a close first round. I think that Kunitskaya is going to probably try to get in close, but just get picked off at range, you know, with the jabs, with the front kicks, 
with the question mark kicks over the top, you know, with the one, two, three, with the two, three or two, five, two, you know, cross lead uppercut cross, boom, boom, boom. I think that that's going to be the story of this fight. I think that the combinations and the clean striking is going to get Eldana up on the cards. I think that if it was a more polished, technical and knowledgeable striker that when Aldana goes to cut off, goes to pivot, goes to angle, they would be able to cut her off. But I don't see Kunitskaya being the person to be able to cut off Aldana. And I think that's just going to lead to a striking, I, I don't want to say a masterclass, but a, a very, very good striking performance from Aldana. So I'm going to go with Irene Aldana to get the victory over Yana Kunitskaya via a third round TKO. I think just accumulation of damage. She's going to ke keep catching her on the way in, keep hurting her. She's got power. Um, you know what? I'm going to switch it. I'm going to go second round. Second round KO, TKO. Um, more than likely a TKO, you know, hurt her, drop her, and uh, you know, finish her off on the ground. So a second round knockout victory for Irene Eldana. All right. Up next in the heavyweight division where the big boys play, you've got Ty Bam Bam Tuivasa coming into this fight with a record of 12 victories and three defeats going up against the Prince of War Greg Hardy coming into this fight with a record of seven victories two defeats and one no contest um you know before this fight I was heavy heavy on Tuivasa before I really got into the research before I really started to dive into the game of Greg Hardy and just kind of revisit some of his good performances and his overall performances um his last fight he had a loss to um, Marcin Tybora, I believe that was his last fight. And, you know, a lot of people, from what I remembered, I thought that Tybora came in, got him to the ground, got on top, and dominated him from start to finish. But if you go back and watch that fight and you really look at it, that's not what happened. You know, Greg Hardy did very, very well in those early rounds. He's got good lateral movement. He's got the explosiveness and he's got the speed. When you've got good movement, got speed and got power in the heavyweight division, that is a lot. And that can take you very, very far. And, you know, he had a fight where he lost but looked decent against Alexander Volkov, who at the time was one of the best heavyweights in the world and currently still is. He just lost to Cyril Ghosn, but... Prior to that, he was on a two-fight, I think a three-fight win streak over, um, no, I'm sorry, a two-fight win streak over Walt Harris and um, Alistair Overeem. And uh, obviously, he lost that fight to Cyril Gunn. It was a close fight. Um, I didn't really get a chance to watch that fight in its entirety. That's why I haven't done a review on that last event. So that should be coming in the next podcast or so. But... Um, he's got good movement. He's got good strikes. He's got a very good left hook. He can move off the center line. He's got a good straight right hand. He really knows how to turn it over and just just pop, pop that right in down the middle. He's got good combinations. One, two, two, three. You know, move laterally, kind of stay on the outside. He's got good movement, good wrestling defense, even though if this fight does get away from him, I think it could be in relation to the wrestling. Luckily for him, he's not really fighting a wrestler. You know, Bam Bam... Tai Tuavasa isn't really known as a heavy grappler. He's known more as a walk forward, get in your face, put the pressure on, land chopping low kicks, really, really dig into those low kicks, land the one, two down the center, land the left hand hook over the top as you step into range, right hand, left hook, right hand, um, and just keep pushing forward, kind of keeping his hands out in front of him, chop with the low kick, push forward, one, chop with the low kick, push forward, two, three, push forward three two he's got heavy power he's got decent cardio you know for being a big heavy heavyweight i know that doesn't really make a lot of sense but he's got a lot of weight on him he's a he's a he's a more um a fluffy style of guy you know he's not a he's not a ripped heavyweight he has lost weight and uh, he's in better shape now later on in his career than he was earlier but he's got good power he's got speed for being so big i would give the speed advantage to Greg Hardy just because of his athletic background, because of the speed at which he's able to throw out those combinations, the one, two, the two, three, slipping counter over the top. I think that the slip counters against a guy like Tuavasa, who primarily is going to look to wing those hooks and shoot those shots down the middle. He can come over the top of that straight punch with a hook. He can come down the center and counter you if you're out of position after you throw a shot. This fight is a lot closer, I think, than people really give 
um, Greg Hardy credit for. I'm not one to sit here and toot the horn of Greg Hardy, but he is a good fighter, and to only have, you know, 10 fights overall in his professional mixed martial arts career and not work too much on the regional scene, had a couple fights on Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series and looked really, really good in those. Um, had some setbacks, like we said, against Marching Tybora. He just got a little bit tired the in the second round because he was just putting it on Tybora in that first round. He got tired, got dragged to the ground, and got TKO'd. Um, had that loss to Alexander Volkov. Had a good performance against um, Jorgen De Castro. So, you know, it, it's one of those fights where is Tui Vasa going to be able to land those low kicks? The low kicks are going to be the story of this fight. Um, you're going to have to look out for the counters of Greg Hardy down the center. Like I said, the straight punches and the hook to follow up. But I do believe that Tui Vasa is going to be able to push back Greg Hardy. It's going to be a tough first round. It's going to be close. But I think he's going to be able to push him back, chop with those low kicks. And that's going to lead Greg Hardy to be stuck stationary and not be able to use his explosiveness, use his lateral movement, use his in and out movement that he got from his NFL days and uh, lead him to get stuck caught by two of Asa. I expect him to push Hardy up against the cage, kind of like he did against Struve, you know, frame off the neck um, or get into the single collar clinch, go with the overhands, go with the uppercuts up the middle, go with the hooks, knees to the body. I think he lands an uppercut up the middle, drops Greg Hardy, jumps on him and gets the knockout victory. So my pick is Ty Tuivasa, Bam Bam, or I guess you should say Ty Bam Bam Tuivasa to get the victory over Greg Hardy via a second round knockout. All right, and now we move to the co-main event of the evening in the welterweight division. And now we move to the main event. You've got the number two ranked Gilbert Dorino Burns coming off of that losing effort against the, the reigning defending welterweight champion of the world, the Nigerian nightmare Kamaru Usman. And uh, in a fight where he, you know, landed some good shots but um, wasn't able to get it done, Going up against the number four ranked, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson coming into this fight with a record of 15 victories, four defeats, and one no contest. The only person in that top 10 that, or in the top five in the top 10 who has not fought Kamaru Usman. This is a number one contender's bout. More than likely after Usman and Covington, run it back because it looks like that's what's going to be next. But the number two ranked Gilbert Dorino Burns, 19 and 4, versus the number four ranked Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, 15, 4 and 1. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal fight. One of the best fights on the entire card, and a fight that I am really, really looking forward to, along with a lot of other people. This is, this is some people's fight of the night because it is so close. It is so dangerous. We don't know how it's going to play out because a lot of the fights where we thought Burns was going to lose that fight and not be able to get the job done, he got it done against Tyron Woodley, against Damian Maya. He has not, he, we thought he was going to lose, thought he was going to get out grappled by Maya, thought he was going to get beat to the punch by Tyron Woodley and just overall outworked and it didn't happen. And he got the victory. Goes into the fight against Usman. Looks good. The only person on this title run to hurt Usman. He caught him with an overhand right over his jab. And uh, dropped him. He stumbled him. He dropped to his knees. He got back up. Um, he landed a good left high kick. He's also got a good uh, hook to a left kick to the body. Um, a really good striker. But against a guy who's, you know, I believe 57-1 and one overall as a professional player. Uh, kickboxer or uh, it might be amateur kick no 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 in professional kickboxing i believe he's 57 and 1 um steven wonder boy thompson um coming off back-to-back -back victories of his own most recently against the highly touted um jeff neal hands of steel or jeff hands of steel neal i guess would sound a little bit better and prior to that a win over the silent assassin vicente luque at ufc 217 which is a big big win just judging off of Luke's recent performances, I mean, he gets a victory over Randy Brown via knockout. He gets a victory over Tyron Woodley most recently by basically knocking him out with a left hook and then submitting him via Darce Choke. Um, he's got a fight coming up against Michael Chiesa at UFC 265, so that's going to be interesting, and um, I'm excited to see where that fight goes. But 
you know, Gilbert Burns does train with Vicente Luque out at Sanford MMA under Henry Hooft. So since Luque has been in there with Wonder Boy, is he going to give him the keys to beat a phenomenal traditional karate taekwondo style of striker more karate based is he going to give him the tools to beat him i know luke didn't beat him but is that going to help him out i believe it'll help him out in camp i think that having a person who's been in there with vicente luke or with steven wonderboy thompson um you know such as vicente luke i think that is going to play a big factor um usman Used to train out there. He obviously is working with Trevor Whitman now. I think he might still work at Sanford MMA a little bit, but I I, I do believe he made the full transition out to uh, Denver with Elevation Fight Team and Trevor Whitman. So, you know, this is a great fight. And let's just look at some of the stats. You look at the tail of the tape, and when you go into it, here is how the stats match up. Um, Gilbert Burns is 5'10", Wonderboy is 6 feet, so he's got a 2 inch height advantage, does Wonderboy Thompson. Um, 71 inch reach for Gilbert Burns to a 75 inch reach for Wonderboy. That is a 4 inch reach advantage for the karate style of striker, and I believe that will play a big, big role in this fight. Leg reach, 2 inch leg reach advantage for Wonderboy, 42 inches to 40 inches for the former title challenger Gilbert Darino Burns. When you look at win percentages, 32% of the wins coming by way of knockout for Gilbert Burns, 44% of the wins coming by way of knockout for Steven Thompson, 42% of the wins coming by way of submission for Burns to 6% by Wonder from Wonderboy Thompson, 26% of the wins coming by way of decision for Burns to 50% for Wonderboy. Looking at average fight time, 11 minutes and 17 seconds for Dorino to 13 minutes and 49 seconds for Wonderboy. So a little bit more experience inside the octagon for the number four ranked Wonderboy. When you look at knockdown averages, 0.35 per 15 minute fight for Burns to 0.72 for Thompson. So a little bit higher of a knockdown average for Wonderboy. When you look at significant strikes, significant strikes landed per minute. 3.15 for Dorino to 3.93 for Wonderboy. 46% significant strike accuracy rate to 44% for Steven Wonderboy Thompson. Strikes absorbed per minute, 2.74 for Gilbert Burns to 2.73 for Wonderboy Thompson. Very, very close, neck and neck in strikes absorbed per minute. 56% of strikes defended by Gilbert Burns to 59% strike and defense for Wonder Boy Thompson. When you go into the grappling, which is a that can also play a big factor in this fight, you got 2.21 takedowns per 15 minutes for Gilbert Burns to 0.36 for Wonder Boy. 37% takedown accuracy for um, Gilbert Burns to a 45% takedown accuracy rate for Wonder Boy Thompson. 50% takedown defense for Burns to a 78% takedown defense for Wonderboy. 0.71 submission average per 15 minute fight to none for Wonderboy Thompson. Um, just going off the stats, this is a great fight and it really is. It's a battle of striker versus grappler without it actually being striker versus grappler. Let me explain. You know, Gilbert Burns can stay on the feet and he can knock you out. Burns has a beautiful overhand right, a beautiful left hook, a really good uppercut from in close, really good slap hook to a body kick from the left side, a really good left high kick. You know, he hides that lead body kick behind the left hook, and then he can go up to the head with a left high kick. You know, he is a striker. He can knock you out. He does have power in his hooks, in his uppercuts, in his overhand punches. But against a guy who I said is 57-0 and or 57-1 and in profession, I believe 57-0, and in professional kickboxing, in Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, a guy who nobody really fights like this in the UFC. Side stance, in and out movement, switching stances off of kicks, throwing spinning back kicks from that southpaw stance, throwing side kicks to the body from the southpaw stance, you know, hook kicks to the head, um, roundhouse kicks, one, two, hide the kick behind the, the right hand, one, two, hide the kick behind the left hand, 
one, two, sidestep to a body kick, switch off on another angle, get to the opposite stance. Wonder Boy is a switch stance fighter. He never primarily stays in one stance. He's moving. He moves laterally and changes his stance. He moves backward, is backwards and changes his stance up. Moves forward and changes his stance. Changes his stance off of kicks. Changes his stance off of defense and pulling back with check hooks from the left and the right side. He is a switch stance fighter. Burns primarily fights in the orthodox stance. He's looking to land that overhand right. Looking to land that left hook, like we said. Looking to land those kicks, which I think can be a problem for Wonder Boy, but it's going to be can Burns get into the range to land those kicks and not get picked off at Slaughter when he stays at that range for a little bit too long. And honestly, I think this is going to be a coming out party for Wonder Boy. Not really a coming out party, but a showcase of just how good of a striker, how good Wonder Boy is overall. And that does not mean that there's not going to be a point where Gilbert Burns can catch Wonder Boy on the feet and knock him out. You know, he got knocked out by Anthony Pettis after he threw that side kick to the body. He swept it away, came off the cage as Wonder Boy was in his side stance and couldn't really back up because he was in that bladed stance. Came off the cage and since he was on a side stance, he wrapped that right hook around instead of going with the Superman punch down the middle. Knocked Wonder Boy out cold, jumped on him and landed some unnecessary damage. So he has been knocked out, but that's really it. He went up against Luke. There was a couple points where during switch stance combinations, um, Luke was able to cut him off, but it only lasted for a little while. Wonder Boy landed that side, that step in side kick to the body, and after Thompson or after um, Luke got back up, he stepped back into orthodox. Boom, boom, landed a one-two down the middle as Luke tried to come in and counter with some good shots. Um, I believe he might have countered a hook that uh, Luke tried to throw down the middle. Boom, boom, dropped him. And uh, just a really, really good fight from him. And then against Jeff Neal, there was a point where maybe he got caught a little bit in the fourth or fifth round and, and Neal might have had him hurt, but it wasn't really much of anything. It was a cruise to a decision victory. Just, you know, now, Neil couldn't track him down. Neil couldn't trap Wonder Boy. He couldn't keep Thompson in the position he needed him to be to be able to land his shots. And the toughest thing to do when you're fighting Wonder Boy is to find the angles on Wonder Boy to land your punches. And that is something I do not feel like Gilbert Burns is going to be able to do. Gilbert Burns is either going to have to come out in this fight, and every time Wonder Boy, you know, after he lands a kick or after he throws a kick and misses, he's going to have to just come in and throw heavy, heavy shots. He's going to have to try to land over the jab of Wonder Boy and go with the overhand right. He's going to have to try to land kicks to the legs to slow down Wonder Boy, just like Anthony Pettis did in his winning performance. He chopped across the legs, a chop with the, chopped across with the low kicks, and slowed down Wonder Boy a little bit, but he still was getting pieced up before that knockout. Burns is probably going to have to resort to that black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu if he wants to win this fight. If it stays on the feet for the full 15 minutes, it's going to be a masterclass from Wonder Boy Thompson. And all of the straight punches that hurt Burns against Usman, the jab, the jab from Southpaw, the straight right hand, the pull counter right hand, those are all going to be huge weapons for Wonder Boy. And almost everything that Wonder Boy throws is straight punches and straight kicks, unless it's a check hook to set you up for a straight punch or it's an overhand if he throws it out with the jab to set it up and come over the top like he did against Luke. Um, the straight punches of Wonder Boy and just the side stance and the footwork and the movement and the stance switches are just going to be way too much for Gilbert Burns. He's going to get caught. He's going to get stuck. And when he gets hit and hurt um, against you know Usman, once he got hurt, that fight was pretty much over and he couldn't keep pushing forward. He did stay in it for a little bit, but once he got hit again, it was over and it was the jab of Usman from Orthodox hurt him originally and then the jab from Southpaw is what dropped him and led to the finishing punches on the ground to put him away. The straight jab, the one-two into the body kick, the one-two into the high kick, the spinning hook kicks and then the wheel kicks to keep Burns away from him. Um, there is going to be a point where Burns can try to crowd Wonder Boy in that side stance as he goes to throw a side kick, maybe step off on the angle, you know, sweep the leg and step off to your right. Um, sweep and step off to your right and then use that left hand to come rush forward and get a body lock, dr spin Wonder Boy around, drag him down, take his back, get the hooks in and get a submission. That is an area where I think Burns can win this fight. The grappling is heavily in the favor of Gilbert Dorino Burns, but 
if I'm going to be 100% honest here, I have Wonder Boy running away with this fight. I think it's a close first round. Burns might try to take him down, but Wonder Boy's got really, really good takedown defense. As you can see, he's got a 78% takedown defense, so he's not easy to get to the ground, and he's not easy to take down. And when you look at the takedown accuracy of Gilbert Burns, he only has a 37% accuracy on his takedown rate. So a 37% takedown accuracy against a guy who's got a 78% takedown defense in Wonder Boy and who is already so hard to track down and cut off with his unorthodox traditional martial arts style of movement in and out in the side stance, in and out, in and out, darting in with the right hand behind it and then a high a body kick behind it. One, two, high kick, you know, one, two, high kick, two, lead high kick, one, two, switch, lead high kick, switch kicks to the body, spinning back kicks, hook kicks, wheel kicks, you know, that step in side kick to the body. I think that side stance, the fakes and feints, faking with the lead hand, fake hook, boom, step in with that side kick, fake, fake, boom, fake, use that knee, step in with that side kick feint to get off on the angle, boom, boom, land the one, two down the center. I think it's going to leave Gilbert Burns open, leave him to get kind of stagnant and stuck staring in the mirror, like we always say and get caught down the center, and get finished by Wonderboy Thompson. So my pick is Steven Wonderboy Thompson to get the victory via a second-round knockout over Gilbert Dorino Burns and vault himself into title contention, being the next person to fight Kamaru Usman or Colby Covington if that fight gets made. But expect Wonderboy to be put on a masterclass performance here, win this fight, and go on to challenge for the strap at 170 pounds. And now we move to the main event of the evening, what everybody here is waiting to listen to. The prediction for the main event in the lightweight division, the trilogy bout, both men one and one, both men coming in off of knocking out the other man. That is the bout between the notorious Conor McGregor and Dustin the Diamond Poirier. What a phenomenal, phenomenal fight this is. Um, it's it's just fantastic that we're getting this trilogy. Both men have knocked each other out. Both men have finished the other man. So it's not like one person won a decision and the other one got a finish, kind of like the McGregor and Diaz trilogy. Or the McGregor-Diaz saga where Diaz finished him in the first fight with that dropping him with the one-two or hurting him with the one-two. He shot in. He went for a uh, guillotine choke, rolled he tried to roll into Diaz. Diaz caught him, rolled in on the top. McGregor gave up his back after some mounted punches, and then he sunk in that choke and got the tap. This is both men knocking out the other. In the first fight at UFC 178, McGregor obviously opens up with that hook kick, pushes Poirier back, um, you know, tries to push him back, lands that uh, one to a left hook, which stumbles Poirier. Um, Poirier counters with an inside low kick, goes to land a good combination, but it doesn't work. And then McGregor, boom, 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 one, three, two, boom, 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 lands that left hand, vicious hammer fist, and gets the first round knockout. With Poirier, it was a little bit closer of a fight, but he definitely made a statement. He definitely made a statement in that fight. He, he pushed forward. Um, in the first round, it was pretty close. Um, I think there is an argument there that you could possibly give the first round to Connor just based off of the heavier shots landed. But um, Poirier did get that takedown and got a, got some decent time in, in top control. So you would probably have to give that first round to Poirier, but I could see it either way. But um, a lot of good work from Dustin in that rematch, a lot of adjustments. Um, Connor made some good adjustments too. The only problem is Connor came in with a boxing heavy style. He expected to knock out Dustin again. He expected the power that he has to not be, or to, he expected the power that he has to be too much for Dustin. And, you know, it just proved not to be. There was a point where I do believe he hurt Dustin. Um, I, I can't be 100%. I can't be 100%. I asked Dia Davis about it. He said um, there wasn't really a point where he got hurt, but he did get flashed at a certain point where he just got hit and was kind of like, whoa, like what, what was that? But he was able to, you know, get his wits back about him and keep pushing forward. Um, this is just a great fight. And let's look at the stats because the stats are important for a big fight of this magnitude. All right. So 
let's look at the stats. Number one ranked Dustin Poirier to the number five ranked con the notorious Conor McGregor. Uh, let's see. So records, if you want to get into records, 27, 6, and 1 for Dustin the Diamond Poirier to 22 wins and five defeats coming for Conor McGregor. But recently in his mixed martial arts career, he has gone... Uh, I believe it's two and three. So he lo he lost to Diaz, and then he beat Diaz. So one and one. He came back and fought um, Alvarez. So two and one. Won that fight. Came in and fought Khabib, which is uh, he lost. So two and two. Came in and fought Cerrone. So three and three, or two and three, or th bleh, bleh, three and three. And then came in and fought Dustin. And lost. So, based off of his last five fights, he is in total. I don't know if I had, if I got the timeline of those fights correct, but I think I did. Here we go. Let's see. So, he lost to Dustin Poirier via second round knockout. He defeated Donald Cerrone. So that's one and one. He lost to Khabib, so one and two. He beat Eddie Alvarez, so two and two. He beat Nate Diaz, three and two. He lost to Nate Diaz, three and three. So he's three and three in his last six fights. If you want to go off the last five, um, it would be... One and two. Um... Two and two, three and two. So he's three and two in his last five fights, but you know, not the McGregor we're used to, not the the win streaks, not the knockout power, not the finishing ability. Yes, he did finish Cowboy Cerrone, but Cerrone was at the tail end of his career at that point. He still was on good wins. He did have some good performances, so you can't completely discredit that win. But it's impressive that he finished him with a high kick and the punches like he did. I did not expect him to land a high kick and finish Cerrone, but you know, it's not the same in terms of resume when it comes to Dustin Poirier's last few wins. I mean, knocking out Conor McGregor, going to war with Dan Hooker, um, losing to Khabib prior to that, you know, beating Max Holloway. And look at what Max Holloway just did to um, Kelvin Cater. Look at how close that second fight was with Alexander Volkanovsky. I mean, beating Eddie Alvarez twice, basically. Well, I mean, you can't count it. So one and one. So one win and one no contest. I mean, beating Justin Gaethje. I mean, just, just a murderer's row. Beating Anthony Showtime Pettis. Just a murderer's row of contenders. And, you know, it led up to that second fight at UFC 257. And the adjustments I noticed from Poirier was immediately, like, he came out and immediately started attacking that calf kick. Immediately was going after the calf kick. You know, chopping that leg, chopping the leg on the outside. He didn't really go with any inside low kicks, which is probably smart from him because you don't want to get countered by Connor. Um, Connor did have a counter to the low kicks a little bit, but it didn't really work. I mean, you could see it a little bit as the fight played out. He tried to counter Dustin with that hook two down the center when he tried to throw that calf kick, or he would try to catch it and then come down the center with the straight left hand. So he would catch it, and boom try to come down the middle now if he has better timing in this fight maybe he can catch it and hurt him but dustin was just on a different level th th that night and again i rewatched the fight the other night and honestly connor did a lot better than i remember the fight was a lot closer when i rewatched it than i thought the the first time you know it, it was at first i thought you know once poirier started landing those kicks i mean it was basically over but that's not really what happened um, Connor was getting chopped with those, the calf kick, chopped with the calf kick. Um, he would go with that one, two, and then a five, which is that lead uppercut. He likes to go either hook two lead uppercut or a one, two lead uppercut. Whenever he would throw the two and kind of slip out of the way, Dustin would, would slip inside or no, he would slip outside and then counter with a check hook. So he would go boom, boom, slip, boom, check hook, boom, boom, slip check hook because Connor's arm is going to be extended his head is going to be out in the center his arm isn't really always up at his head sometimes it was so he was able to block that check hook but he would throw that straight left 
and then boom, get countered with that check right hook of Dustin. And Dustin would quickly you know, like do a little triangle step to get off on another angle and then reset. So he would boom, triangle step, boom, right hook, triangle step, get off on an angle, kind of play with him. There was a point where he overextended on that left hand because the calf kicks were causing so much damage. And you saw Poirier just cover, boom, counter with the right hook. And he went, pointed at him and said, like, I got you, Connor. I got you. You're, you're on your way out. And, you know, but Connor did some good stuff in early in the fight. I mean, that first round was a high level first round. I mean, a lot of stuff, a spinning hook kick from McGregor, the countering calf kicks of Dustin Poirier, the, the slipping or countering that left hand with the, with the outside calf kick, you know, um, trying to counter with the check hook, you know, trying to step in with the jab and then get Connor countering over the jab of Dustin, you know, with that straight left, boom, boom. Because when you're in southpaw versus southpaw, you both have the same weapons. It's going to be a left, a jab, and it's going to be a straight left. Well, McGregor's got a better straight left. Fourier's got better combinations. Fourier had better low kicks. Connor didn't use low kicks. And that was part of the problem as well. Connor McGregor really, really, really stuck in a boxing style of stance against a guy in Dustin Poirier who knew that in the first fight, the low kicks worked. He landed a low kick in the first fight and knocked Connor off balance and almost caught him with a, with a shot, but he was able to pull back, get back his balance and, you know, move away. But Connor did, um, Connor just kind of walked forward in that boxing stance and pushed him back. And it did work pretty well for him in the first round. Landing the jab. His jab did land on Poirier. Connor's got a really, really nice jab. So does Dustin. Um, he kind of just fakes that left hand. You know, he paws out with the left hand to try to catch your shot so he can counter you over the top with the left. And then probably a right hook or a right uppercut. Straight left, boom, right hook or right uppercut. But he would paw, paw, kind of lean a little bit forward lean forward on his lead leg and anytime he would lean forward on the lead leg Dustin would chop in with the calf kick because when you lean forward in that boxing heavy style of stance you know your weight's all on your front leg you're not going to be able to pick it up and check you can probably try to turn your knee out but your weight's all the way on it so it's not going to be enough time for you to turn that knee out and check the kick but he would fake fake boom pop the jab fake the left hand lean a little bit forward boom pop the jab and it would land on Poirier. And Poirier, you know, it hurt him at some point. And then he used that fake left hand to lean forward and throw that straight left kind of lazy. And then, boom, come up the middle with that long up jab or uh, lead uppercut. And that stunned. I think that's the shot that flashed Dustin. I can't 100% be correct. But if you'd like to go back and listen to my interview I did with Daya Davis prior to or right after the second fight at UFC 257, that is going to be in the obviously in the episode and in the episode log and in the link in any of my social media descriptions um you can check that out and then obviously don't forget to check out the interview i just did with dia davis about let's see today's the fifth about four days ago we did it right before this trilogy fight on july 10th so um dustin just seemed to be a lot more comfortable and he seemed to be able to take the shots a lot better and, you know, the first fight with Connor and Dustin was at 145 pounds. The second one was at 155. The third one's at 155. Dustin can take shots a lot better at 155. And that kind of played into the role where, yes, he got cracked with some heavy shots from Connor. There was a point where Connor um, caught him as he tried to move in and throw a low kick. Hook two, the three two. Connor is a lot better with the three two than the one two. He likes to hook, get the outside foot, and then the straight left, mainly against an orthodox fighter. But when he gets you up against the cage, he likes to hook cross on that angle so that he cuts you off in both directions and you're forced to circle into the left hand. So he, he cuts you off on his right side as you're circling that way and then directs you into the left up against the cage because you have to turn into the punch as you circle off the fence. Tried that against Dustin. It didn't work. He was able to get out of the, out of the range. And a lot of the reasons with that, that left hand started to not land as much in the second round was again because of the calf kicks. And I know people are gonna say, well, Dustin did more than just calf kick. Of course he did, of course he did, but you set your foundation with those calf kicks. You make it harder for Connor to push off of his lead leg. You make it harder for Connor to put a lot of power in that lead and that rear hand and that straight left. You make it harder for Connor to move in and out and be able to explode and back out and get out of range. If he threw a punch, he was there for the counter after those calf kicks started to land because he wasn't able to pull his leg back. He wasn't able to 
pull his weight back because of the dead leg, the lead leg. When you kick the calf, you kick that peroneal nerve and that, you know, makes your foot fall asleep and it makes it harder for you to walk. It makes it harder for your foot to move. It makes your foot roll. You know, you can roll your ankle and hurt yourself. I mean, you look at Henry Cejudo versus Demetrius Johnson, number two, right away once those calf kicks started landing, it hurt Cejudo really bad. You look at most recently, um, you know, Anthony Smith versus Jimmy Crute. Anthony Smith, once he started landing those calf kicks, I mean, Crute couldn't even stand up. He was falling over and he got finished via the calf kick. And I think we're going to see Dustin go right back to those low kicks. For Connor, what Connor needs to do is he needs to go back to that karate style. He needs to go back to the in and out movement. He needs to be in and out, light on his feet, cutting angles. And the other thing he has to do how do you beat a guy who throws kicks? You kick the kicker. You wouldn't want to do that with a guy like Edson Barbosa unless you're chopping the legs because you chop the legs and you, you kick the calf like Justin Gaethje did. It makes it a little bit harder and a little bit more hesitant for him to throw those kicks and that can open up your kicks and it can also open up your striking game and get you to get at the correct distance. So what Connor needs to do is resort back to how he used to fight. In and out, you know, switching stances constantly in and out movement you know slipping and countering he still slips and counters with the straight left you'll see him catch 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 jab catch jab catch jab catch lead uppercut straight left catch straight left right hook you know he, he does a lot of the same stuff he's really really good with the movement and you know the movement and switching stances back and forth and kind of moving in and out out of range but you have to stick to that style. If you stand in the boxing heavy stance and you stay in that game, you're gonna get caught by Dustin because you're gonna get caught in the same spot you got caught in in the rematch. You're gonna get chopped with the calf kicks. You're gonna get countered with that check hook over your straight left hand. It's gonna happen. So unless you kick the kicker, Connor needs to go back to that style on the karate style, in and out, in and out. You know, switching stances, moving left and right, switch stance, spinning hook kicks, spinning hook kicks to the head, spinning kicks to the body, front stabbing front kicks to the body. That needs to be in Connor's wheelhouse for this fight. And uh, I do think that he can do it, but it's a very, very tough task for him. He also needs to, um, what was I going to say? I got, I got off track. Hold on. So the footwork, the movement, the high kicks, in and out. Um, I mean, that's kind of what he needs to do. And oh, what I was going to say is we, and we kind of already touched on it. Kick the kicker. Um, if you chop your low kicks with Dustin, it's not going to make it as easy for him to land his own low kicks and land those calf kicks. And also, if you learn how to land those calf kicks and they're working and they're working and then you can fake that and land up top with your jab, land with your one, two, land with your three, two, then it's again going to make Dustin a little bit hesitant. It might get him off a beat a little bit and then boom, boom. For Dustin, we already said, you got to land the calf kicks. You got to set it up. Dustin pretty much has to fight the fight he fought last time, except make a little bit of a slight adjustment. I think that if he uses those long combinations early on and uses a lot of feints, feint the jab, feint the left hand, feint the jab, right hook, left hand, right uppercut, feint the, feint the uppercut, left hand, right hook, slip, roll underneath, you know, play a little bit with Connor, stay on the outside, shoot a takedown. One thing we saw Dustin do in the last fight, which is something I definitely touched on in the predictions leading up, was stepping over. So what he likes to do is when he's in that southpaw stance, he likes to fake with the left hand. He jabs with the right hand, fakes with the left hand, uses it to step into orthodox and then come over the top with the overhand right from a southpaw stance. So it's a switch stance overhand. What he did in the fight against Connor in the second fight, and we saw him do it against Khabib as well, is um, he would fake, fake, look like he's going to step into south into orthodox, but then go right back into southpaw, use that to close the range, use that jab to look like you're going to overextend to get on that opposite stance overhand. And he would he stepped in, got the got the double leg, got his head in the inside, I believe. I know, head on the outside, drag Connor one way, then drag them back the other and got the takedown. The only reason he got that takedown is because of the threat of the over the switch stance overhand. He used that fake switch stance switch to get the correct angle and get on the inside against Connor and then got the double leg, turned one way and then directed him back towards the other direction and got the takedown. That is something I think he's going to want to use. 
but uh, Connor's going to be looking for those takedowns, and Connor is also going to have to set up his kicks. If you don't set up your kicks against Dustin, it might leave you open to get countered. It might leave you open for that check right hook. It might also leave you open to get taken down. So Connor has to be on his P's and Q's. And um, I do think there's going to be a lot of clinch work. I do think this fight's going to go a little bit longer. And if it doesn't, if the fight ends quicker this time than the previous fight, it's because Conor McGregor knocks out Dustin Poirier. But uh, let's look at the stats. I mean, we always look at the stats. It's important for the main event. So height, same 5'9 for each guy. Um, reach, a two-inch reach advantage for Conor McGregor. He's going to want to use that. He's going to want to stay at kicking range for a lot of this fight. And uh, it's, uh, you know, wait, 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 wait. 74-inch uh, reach for McGregor to a 72-inch reach for Dustin the Diamond Poirier. Um, a half-inch leg reach advantage for Poirier, which could come into factor when it comes to the cap kicks. So that's 40 and a half-inch leg reach to 40-inch leg reach for Conor McGregor. 52% um, of the wins coming by way of knockout for Poirier. 86% of the wins coming by way of knockout for uh, Conor McGregor. 22% by submission for Poirier. 5% by submission for Conor. And 26% of wins coming by way of decision for Dustin Poirier to 9% be a decision for the notorious Conor McGregor. Average fight time pretty close, 8 minutes and 55 seconds for the uh, Dustin the Diamond Poirier to 8 minutes and 16 seconds for the notorious Conor McGregor. Knockdown averages 0.8 knockdowns for Dustin Poirier in a 15 minute fight to almost 2 knockdowns per 15 minute fight for McGregor at 1.81. When you look at significant strike percentages and overall stats, 5.59 significant strikes land per minute for the diamond, 5.32 significant strikes landed per minute for Conor McGregor. They're neck and neck tied with significant strike accuracy. 49% for Dustin Poirier, 49% for Conor McGregor. Strikes absorbed per minute. There's a little bit of a discrepancy here. 3.69 for Dustin Poirier to 4.54 for the notorious Conor McGregor. 56% striking defense for Dustin Poirier to 54%. For McGregor. When you look at the grappling, it is 1.75 takedowns per 15 minute fight for the Diamond to 0.7 for the notorious Conor McGregor. 41% takedown accuracy for Poirier to a 55% takedown accuracy rate for McGregor. Takedown defense 69% for Poirier to 67% for Conor McGregor. And submission averages 1.32 for the Diamond to none. Zero for McGregor. Um, let's go back a little bit on what we touched on. So when I talked about the switch stance of Dustin Poirier, there is a brief opening for Connor to exploit that and land the straight left hand as Poirier tries to switch from southpaw to orthodox to land that overhand. And he did it in the second fight, but it didn't land. Poirier was able to pull away from it, see the shot coming, and kind of roll away and get out of the range. But there is an opening for that shot and look out for it in this trilogy fight. Conor McGregor, when Dustin Poirier goes with that double jab or he flicks out that straight left hand to disguise the step forward into orthodox, and go into the, the overhand, Conor McGregor needs to take a brief step over to his left. You saw it here. As Dustin tries to switch stance, as he steps forward into, into orthodox, right as he's about to take that step, McGregor takes a slight step out to his, out to his left on that rear hand or on that rear side, gets off on an angle so Poirier is, is perpendicular to McGregor, and then boom, you can shoot that straight left hand in. The problem is, Connor is going to have it one, two, three steps ahead. So as Poirier even goes to step into that opposite stance, once that foot touches the ground, you boom, step in with that straight left and catch Poirier as he's kind of in a square stance. You Or you can wait, have him overextend, boom, and then you double jab, because instead of a 1-2 or a 3-2, it adds an extra beat to the combination. So you double jab, boom, and then you throw the left hand. You change up the timing, the shots that didn't land before can land again. And I guess it's time to get to my prediction for the fight. I think it's time. I'm going to go with Dustin Poirier. I think Dustin Poirier gets the win, and I think he gets it similarly to the, first, the last fight. And the fight was a lot closer than I remember in that second fight. But once Poirier had McGregor hurt, it was over. 
once he had him hurt, that was it. Once he got that combat, once he smelled blood, he landed four, five, six, seven, eight punch combinations. You know, one, one, two, hook, uppercut, uppercut, hook, two, hook, hook, cross, uppercut, uppercut, hook, uppercut, hook, one, one, two, overhand right, step in, right hook, boom, boom, step in, boom, land that right hook as Connor tried to slip away, drop him, jumped on him, and got the knockout. Once he smelled blood, that was it, and the fight was over. Um, I do expect McGregor to land some good shots here. I think the first round is going to be very close, just like the last fight was. But I do think that Dustin Poirier, the, the reason I'm picking him is because from January to July, Connor is not going to have the necessary amount of time to make adjustments to the calf kick. He acted like he's never been hit with that technique before. He never knew what a calf kick was. He didn't know how that was going to work. That tells me that it's not going to be enough time to learn the technique, learn how to defend it, and apply that defense in a contest against a guy who knocked you out the last time. He's not going to be able to adjust to those calf kicks. Dustin's going to have to mix up the timing, set up a little bit of feints, maybe throw a high kick early to kind of throw Connor off. And uh, But I think those calf kicks are going to land. I think it's only going to be a matter of time. And I think Connor's going to land some good shots. I think Connor's going to hurt Poirier at a point. If Connor starts early with the kicking game, with the spin kicks, the front kicks to the body, chopping with his own low kicks and using his footwork and movement, I think Connor will knock out Dustin. If he uses kicks in his game to shut down the kicks of Poirier, which would open up his punching power and open up his boxing and use that lateral movement, use that in and out movement, Dustin or Connor can win that fight via knockout. But I don't think it's enough time. I don't think it's enough. I am going to go with Dustin the Diamond Poirier to defeat the notorious Connor McGregor via a third round TKO. I think he finishes him again. And I think after this, Connor fights Diaz. Maybe fights Tony Ferguson, maybe gets one more big fight, and then I think Connor's kind of on his way out. It pains me to say this because I'm a huge fan of Connor McGregor. I always have been. I'm rooting for him here. I'm also a huge fan of Dustin. I don't want to see either of these guys lose. They're two of my favorite guys in the entirety of the UFC. I'm rooting for Dustin. He he's always had my respect and I've always been a fan. I'm rooting for Connor because I've always been a fan of him and I want to see him get the job done. I want to see him come back. But I cannot pick against Poirier here. So Dustin the Diamond Poirier to defeat the notorious Conor McGregor via a third round knockout. All right, guys, that's going to be it for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed my preview, my predictions for UFC 264. I am so hyped for this event. I hope you guys are as well. A stacked prelim card, an amazing co-main event, and a trilogy bout for the ages. Um, the podcast is available anywhere you get your podcast. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, Stitcher, Breaker, Beaker, and many, many more. Anywhere you can get your audio podcast, you can listen to the Touch Em Up podcast. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. I'm your host, Double M, and I'm out. Have a good night, everybody, and enjoy the fights next weekend.